The video I get the most requests to make is about pemmican, and with good reason. Most people, including myself, consider pemmican to be the ideal trail food. Pemmican is very nutritionally dense. It is shelf-stable, meaning it requires no refrigeration and will last for years. In addition, pemmican can be added to other ingredients to make a more complete meal. If you're interested in learning more about what pemmican is and how it's made, keep watching. Historically, pemmican was made by First Nations people as a way of preserving meat against those times when fresh food was not available. Later, French voyagers and English traders would carry this calorie-rich food with them along on their journeys as it had little risk of going bad. Making pemmican in a traditional manner would start with the killing and butchering of a large game animal, such as a bison, a moose, or a deer. The meat would then be cut into long thin strips and allowed to dry slowly over low heat until it became hard and brittle. At the same time, the animal's fat would be removed, added into a pot, placed over an open fire at low heat and rendered until it became a clear liquid. The dried meat would then be pounded into a fine powder. That powdered meat would be added back into the clear liquid fat in equal proportions by weight. At that time, if other ingredients were available, such as dried berries, they were added to add both flavor and additional nutrition. Once the entire mixture was hardened up, it would be wrapped in animal skins to keep it dry and preserve it for later use. Well, today we don't have to use such traditional old school methods for making pemmican here at home. We can use modern things such as a dehydrator, a food processor, and a slow cooker. All right, let's get started. All right, when it comes to the ingredients for making pemmican, really there's only two, meat and fat. Really, that's all there is, just meat and fat. Now you can add other things to the pemmican, we'll talk about that later, but the best product will result from just meat and fat. All right, so what type of meat? Well, ideally and historically, it'd be wild game. Ideal, uh, historically, it'd be bison, but it could be, of course, moose, Deer, bear, anything that you can get your hands on, wild game is the best. Now, if you can't get your hands on wild game, like most of us can't, then you can use, uh, the next best thing, of course, would be grass-fed, grass-finished beef. Nice, high-quality meat. But, of course, that can be expensive and maybe a little hard to get in some places. So you can go to the grocery store and you can buy your meats there. What you're going to look for is the leanest cut of meat possible. Any visible fat needs to be cut off before you dry it. Now, two cuts of meat that I'm going to be using for this demonstration. One is beef liver, extremely lean, and the other is a beef brisket. As you can see, it does have some fat on it that I am going to have to trim off. Those are two of the least expensive cuts of meat in the grocery store. So don't have to spend a lot of money on this. But again, whatever you choose, make sure it is lean. Now, as far as the fats go for making pemmican, there is really only one choice that you want to concentrate on, and that is the kidney fat or the organ fat from the animal. If, again, if it's wild game, that's where you'll find it is around, mostly around the kidneys and some of the other organs. You don't want the belly fat. You don't want the fat that's on the muscle. I mean, they'll work, but they don't harden up the way the belly fat, kidney fat does. So that's what you want to concentrate on getting. Now, where are you going to find that at? Well, I did go to a grocery store and I found this, and this is known as suet. At least it's sold as suet. And what it is, is basically the organ fat, the kidney fat that's been run through a grinder and pelletized and sold. Nice thing about this is it really melts down very quickly because of it's already into small, small pieces. And most of the little bits of meat that you'll often get in the organ, uh, organ fats uh, have been removed as well. So it just makes filtering it out a little bit easy. Optionally, and even better, is if you can get something like this. This is organ fat. This is from uh, grass-fed cows that was picked up at one of our local farms. I was very fortunate to get this. About a five pound bag is what they held for me. A little bit more expensive than maybe other fats because it's grass-fed organic, but cheaper than the suet was because of the bulk quantity and the fact that it's not processed down. All right, now what we need to do is take each of these and break them down into the smaller components so that we can, one, for the meat, dry it out, two, for the fats, 
uh, render it out. All right, let's start with processing the meat and I'm going to be doing the beef liver first. And the reason is, is there's gonna be a bit more work with the brisket as you'll see in a few moments time. First question you're probably gonna ask is, Mark, why did you choose beef liver in the first place? Well, there's a few very good reasons. One is, I don't think you can find a leaner, leaner cut of meat in the grocery store or a cheaper cut of meat for that fact. And beef liver is full of nutrients. Despite the information out there about it not being healthy, it actually is very healthy. It's a lot of what are you cooking it with. All right, so one uh, little trick, and I'm not sure that I am going to be able to do my own trick. If you have it frozen like I did for a period of time and you want to make it easier on yourself for cutting this, don't allow it to completely defrost to a warm, soft state. If it's still slightly frosty, you're gonna find it easier to cut because as you can see, it's gonna have movement and that's gonna make it a little challenging to cut. Extremely sharp knife will help with this. But if it's nice, it's still partially frozen, it's much, much easier. Now, cut it as thin as you can reasonably do so. And the reason why you want to do that is it's a lot easier uh, to dry. It'll dry faster and more thoroughly right through, but also it's going to be easier after it's dry to take it to the next step, which is turning it basically into a powder. So you can see I'm cutting it very, very fine. Really, this is no different than making jerky. I may be cutting it a little finer if I can than I would jerky. But, and it's definitely going to be drier than jerky. Jerky is normally dried too. So that's all there is to cutting this up. I'll go cut this up first and then I'll bring the beef brisket in and well, as you'll see, that'll take a bit more work. Okay, I got my brisket out and I'm ready to cut that out. Now, looking at this, this is going to look to be, have a lot of fat. Maybe not your first choice of meats. Remember I said go with the leanest, leanest cut possible. I chose this and the liver just to show you can go with cheap cuts of meat and still do it. But at the same time, this is going to be a bit more work. So you can see I have two collection bowls here. So what I want to do with these is in one, I'm going to capture all the meat. In the other, I'm still going to save the fat because that fat, not that much, but still fat and good fat, not, not too bad. I'll throw it in with the rest of it. No sense letting it go to waste. That's only a small portion considering how much fat I have there. So I guess the way to start is to start with whatever is visible on the outside. I'm not going to get all the meat off of it. Don't try. It's not worth your effort. Just to do the best you can. And same thing when it comes to drying this. You want to go as lean as possible, but don't throw your meat away if there's a tiny bit of fat on it. You'll know after the fact when you get it dry whether or not it's going to uh, be an issue for you. Yeah, that's not too bad. Okay, there's a little bit of fat there. So I'm just going to work at this and try to get a little bit of fat off. A bony knife probably would have been a better choice for this instead of this big monster of a knife, but it's got a nice tip on it, so I should be able to work my way down and get some of that off. Yeah, I'm starting to cut off too much of the meat to go with. Now, when you get a meat like this, which is very grainy, as you can see, a lot of muscle fibers going in a different direction, try and figure out which way the muscle fibers are going and cut across them. Now, I know that that's the ideal thing to do for jerky because it just makes chewing it not that much easier. Not as important when you're making pemmican because it's all going to be crushed down to powder. But if you can, it just makes it a little bit easier when it comes to the point of grinding. I can, I, I can probably still work a little bit of this fat off. Oh, that was a good piece to come off. As I said, I'm not going to get it all off and I'm not, I'm not even going to try too much. I can probably get more off as I go. So let me see, the grain appears to be going at an angle. Oh, that figures. So I'm just going to cut it in this size because that looks like a good size for it laying out on the dehydrator. Now, here's the good news. This is still almost frozen. There's just starting to defrost on top. So this is going to be an example of what I meant about uh, very easy to cut into thin strips. You can get almost paper thin when it's still frozen like that. See, almost paper thin. If you can do that, that's ideal. If you can't, it's not the end of the world. I think probably more important than how thin you get it is the consistency. So that when you lay it on your dehydrator 
to dry, uh, it's dry all at the same time. You don't want any of it still moist or still soft at all. You want it all dry. So, all right, you can see how easily that's coming off. There is a bit of fat in this, isn't there? All right, we're going to go with it. Now, on the dehydrator, I'm going to separate these out into brisket and liver on, on different trays so that we can see what the end products uh, look like in comparison to each other. So I'll continue to work here, cutting this brisket down into thin, thin sheets, and then we'll be taking it all down to the dehydrator. So the next step in the process of uh, processing the meat is to set it up on my dehydrator. Now, a couple of things. Uh, this is a very basic dehydrator. I did not pay a lot for this. It's the second dehydrator that I've owned over the years. And the reason I chose this one as an upgrade to the first is because I can do uh, set both the temperature and the time. And speaking of temperature, you want your dehydrator to be able to go to approximately 160 degrees Fahrenheit. A little warmer is okay. A little cooler, I wouldn't recommend. And the reason is, is you don't want any pathogenic organisms like bacteria or anything to get a chance to grow on the meat before it dries out. So make sure your dehydrator can go to at least 160 degrees. Now I said I had a very basic dehydrator. If you've got a much better one, the job is that much easier for you. This requires a little bit more work in that I do have to occasionally rotate the trays to make sure that they're all drying easily. Now if you don't have a dehydrator, you can can still do this in your home using your home oven. Most ovens will go to a low temperature of around 170 degrees Fahrenheit or what yeah I think it's 170 degrees Fahrenheit at least our oven is and you can place your meats out on a rack. I would recommend parchment paper helps to make sure it doesn't stick and uh, makes it easy to get off afterwards and leave the door open a crack one or two inches and most oven doors do have that setting where you can leave it open a tiny bit and and you can do it that way. It's just easier with a dehydrator. It's almost set it and forget it. Uh, this is going to take every bit of 10 hours, at least with my dehydrator. So uh, be prepared for that. So I've got my first tray in and all I'm going to do is start by laying in my strips. This is the liver in this case. Now, as far as laying these in, it's really no different than doing uh, jerky. You want a little bit of space in between. They will shrink, of course, as they dry, but you want a little bit of space in between to allow air to circulate. It's always a bit of a puzzle to make sure that you maximize the amount of space, especially if your dehydrator doesn't have a lot of capacity. I think I'll get two hands involved in the action here. Some little pieces. Now, if you've got some very small pieces, end pieces that you couldn't cut into strips, strips that would span the uh, little segments inside of the dehydrator, I have made screens for these dehydrators, especially when I'm doing vegetables and the like, and they can be very small and they dry. And if they get very small, they drop right through. So to prevent that from happening, I've made screens. I'll show those in a future. Uh, video. I won't need it for this video, of course, because these are all big enough that they'll stay on the large openings here. And this, these large openings are much nicer when it comes to drying things out. All right, not a lot to see here. I've just got to get all of this meat on the dehydrator trays, and then I'll switch over and do the brisket, do exactly the same thing. I'll set the temperature for 160 degrees. And that's all there is to do except for wait for it to be done. Okay, as far as preparation of the uh, organ fats, all I have to do for the palletized beef suet is just open it up and put it in the slow cooker that I'm going to be used for rendering it down. And I'll do that in a moment and show you doing that. I'm going to set that aside. Now, as far as the rest of this huge conglomeration, I do have some processing to do. So I'll start. I won't do it all on camera, but I'll give you an idea of where it goes. So you can see it's it's got a lot of sinew and things in it. So it, you do have to kind of break it down a little bit. Now, you don't have to take this and make it into the smallest pieces, but you know, if you can chop it up into smaller pieces, it's going to start rendering that much faster. And uh, you know, there's the pieces that will fall out of it as it turns to liquid will be smaller as well. So that's basically all I'm gonna do is just take this and chunk it up like I'm doing now. Maybe chop it down a little bit. Helps to have a nice sharp knife, of course, to do this. So I'll continue doing this and then I'll start putting it in the slow cookers that I have. 
Right, as mentioned earlier, we're going to be making this pemmican the modern way in our home, in our kitchen, not the traditional way, which of course would be to do everything outdoors over a very, very slow smoky fire to dry the meat and a pot of some type to render down the fat. So as far as rendering down the fat, I've chosen to go with slow cookers because to be honest, they're the easiest and the safest. Now you can still do this on your stove with a pot. I have done that in small quantities. The issue with doing it on the stove and a pot is that you have to keep a close eye on it because you're going to be doing this at a low temperature and it's going to take quite some time as you'll, you'll see. But if you do it on the stove, you have to pay attention to the heat control. You don't want it bubbling and have it spit out. And if you have, for instance, a gas range, uh, you could create a fire and you don't want to burn your product either. So slow cookers are the easiest way to go. Now I've got these two heating up right now on high, but once I get them loaded with the fat, I'm going to be turning them down to low, putting the lid on, and just leaving them go. It will take hours to be quite honest, but that's okay. I know that it won't burn. The heat is very controlled and I'll show you what it looks like before we go to the filter out process. All right, to start, I'm going to use the smaller of the two here for the pelletized, although I expect I'm not going to get all the fat in that, that other fat in the big one. So let's just start. So I'm going to be pouring in my pelletized stuff here, capture it all. All right, that's good. I got it all, a couple little pieces left behind. And in the other one, I'm going to be putting the stuff that I chopped off on the counter. You can still see there's still some sinew and stuff that's holding together. But once it renders down, all that sinew and any little bits of meat that sometime get uh, left inside will all sink to the bottom. All right, let's start by filling that up. Uh, I've still got quite a bit more over here that I have to put in the bowl and put in here. I just wanted to show you that started. So I'll continue filling these up. I'll put the covers on. I'll let them go. And when they're down to the point where they're ready to be filtered, that's when I'll bring you back. All right, let's take a quick look at what has happened as a result of the rendering. So you can see the liquid be fat, nice and clear, just the way you want it to be. And all the stuff you see down in the bottom is what's left behind. There's still a little bit floating. I could leave that go a little longer. It will eventually all go to the bottom, but uh, it's okay to move on at this point as well. And there is the other ones, the pelletized version. That just, that rendered down very, very quickly. All right, so the next step will be to filter this. Okay, now as far as filtering goes, it doesn't have to be anything complicated. All I'm really trying to do is to get the, the majority of those cracklings out. So there's a number of ways you can do it. You can see that I have a glass, a Pyrex type pitcher here, and I'll explain why I'm using this rather than another pot in a moment's time. You can see I just have a small screen thing on top, but I do want to catch more than the screen itself will catch. Ideally, I don't have it with me. I wish I had purchased some for this project, but cheesecloth. Cheesecloth is great because it's sterile. Well, it's clean anyway, and it's disposable. So you don't have to worry about cleaning it out afterwards. But what I have used successfully in the pack is a bandana. And it's in fact what I am going to use today. Um, don't try a coffee filter. It's not going to work. The fat is too thick to go through a coffee filter. And you can see I just have some paper towel down here and that's just to catch any drip so I don't get in trouble for making a mess on the counter. Uh, paper towel also will not catch well, it'll catch everything. It's just that you, your fat's going to have a long time going through it. So something clean is really all you really have to have. And uh, yeah, so you can see I'm just going to use that now. Yeah, it is a bit hot. So well, I think I can get away without it. Okay, so my, I'm going to use pour the crock through. Hopefully you'll be able to see what I'm doing. Try to clear it up. And it's just a matter of pouring it through. Did leave some of the cracklings behind and that's okay. I'm letting it drain out. Hopefully that's trying to make sure it's catching everything. All right, that's pretty much all of it. Now, I'm going to let you know, I'm not going to throw those cracklings away. Uh, I'm actually going to eat them because they're really, really, really tasty. It's going to take a second for everything to drain through. It's going to catch whatever cracklings did pour in. And when it's done, I'll show you what a clear product looks like. 
All right, just before I move on to the next step, I, I just want to mention those cracklings you saw in the pots before I ran it through the filter could have been left in the pot for a while longer. They will turn, some of them were crispy, some of them were still a little soft. If you leave them long enough, they will all turn brown and crispy and go to the bottom of the pot. What's nice about that is that they're just edible the way they are. And uh, uh, yeah, I know that a lot of people are thinking, how healthy can this possibly be? Well, when you're considering what pemmican is, it's just as healthy as the rest of the meal. So I did save what I put behind. I put them in a fry pan. I am going to heat them up and I am going to actually eat them because they're actually quite tasty. But what I wanted to point out is that uh, I didn't let the, them go as far as I could have to get down to the crackling size, but that's okay. You can see what I have now. By the way, this is not all of the fat that I had. I still have more that I have to render uh, because I couldn't get it all reasonably into the two slow cookers in the first go around. Now, here's the other thing I need to mention. My beef, though the lip, actually the liver is dry, but that uh, other brisket piece is, some of it is still not quite dry. I checked on it a few minutes ago and it needs to go a little further uh, so that it snaps. I'll show that when I get to that point which means that I actually am ahead of the game as far as the fat goes. So I have this fat, I need to do something with it, and you can do this if you have a mismatch in your timing, or you can do this for storage and make it into small blocks. So what am I gonna do? I'm actually gonna just put it in silicone muffin tray. And when you put it in the silicone muffin tray uh, and you, you let it cool off, even better if you put it outside where it's cold, like it is today, um, it's going to harden up into small blocks, which I can then store and use for later or and then render that down for making pemmican with. But as I said, I've got more to render down and my beef is not quite ready. So to do this, easy enough, it's hot, uh, but I'm just simply going to pour it in, uh, maybe half full, not for any reason other than there's no reason to have it too much in each one of these. All right, so I'll continue to pour this in until this is full. And uh, the next step will be to wait on the beef for that to be finished. And once the beef is finished, I'll show you what to do with that. All right, quickly, just before moving on, I thought I'd share you the product that I ended up with after rendering down all of that tallow. Here is one of the blocks I removed from the silicone mold. It is very nice, clean, white, very solid at room temperature. Yeah, that turned out really well. In fact, I got all of this from that, that uh, amount of tallow that I had. So, you know, tallow can be used for other things than just making pemmican. It, it has been used for a long time for cooking and deep frying because it has such a high smoke point. It actually works very well for that. But it has been used for other things like making soaps and candles or making healing balms and salves. So tallow actually is a very useful thing to have around the house. You can even use it on your leather or waterproofing items, maybe lubricating, especially two pieces of wood or anything you want to lubricate. It actually is very, very useful to have. So that tallow is certainly going to be helpful here. I'll keep it here. I, can go, I am going to put it in the freezer although it's not necessary and then as I find some inexpensive lean cuts of meat I can make some more some, uh, pemmican with it or whatever other use I can think of. All right now let's move on. All right now we're going to prepare to grind the dried meat down into a very fine powder and I just wanted to show you a couple of options. Of course historically two rocks would have been used or a rock and a log or two pieces of wood, whatever that was available and designed for the purpose of grinding the meat down. Uh, today, of course, we're not using rocks. Well, we can, we could use this, a mortar and pestle. So this is uh, designed for grinding things down. If you've ever tried this, you're gonna know how much work it actually takes. I did use this for this purpose and it does take a lot of work. There's a few tricks for it, but if you have an option other than the mortar and pestle, choose that. Another option that I tried, and this is a larger one, this is an old school meat grinder, and it'll work. It'll do the job of grinding it down into a powder, but again, it is a lot of work, and if your meat pieces are at all thick, thicker than you probably should have let them get, then this gets really hard to turn. So again, if you have no other option, yes, you can make this work. But since we're making 
a video on the modern means of making pemmican. Use this. This is what you want. Now, this is a small food processor. That's all we use around the house. We don't have a full-size one, but it is just fine. Just don't put too much in it at any time. So this is what I'm going to do, and I'll set up now, and I'm going to use my food processor to turn my dried meat into powdered meat. All right, here's my two sources of meat that it took some time to dry, I'll admit, but, you know, worked out pretty well. Uh, this is that beef liver. This actually dried very quickly, and part of the reason was is I was able to get it to a very, very thin cut, which really helps. This is what you're looking for. Snap. Absolute just snap. No bend at all. That's what you want from your meat. So there's the liver. Here is the beef brisket. Now, a couple of comments on the beef brisket. Uh, this is probably a good example. This again, look at this, just falling apart. That's all you really want. If there's any bend to it, then it's not dry enough. Here's an issue I came across with this. I didn't anticipate it when I bought it, but I'll have to deal with it. Here is a good example. Hopefully that's showing up on camera. Um, I thought I trimmed away pretty much all of the fat. I wasn't able to get it all out. So some of it that was hidden and in the slices uh, is right there. And you really don't want to use this if you can help it. And the reason being is this is not fully rendered. In other words, it's not like the tallow we made from the other beef fat. And when it's not rendered completely, it is a source of possibly going bad, possibly going rancid. So what I'm going to have to do with this pile of meat is go through and just kind of take out any little chunks of fat that I find. You can see how easily it's coming out. Now I've got a couple of lean pieces of meat. It does mean that I am going to reduce the overall amount of meat that I have to grind later. But uh, uh, you're better off doing that than using it and having your meat go rancid. Now, I'm not going to throw this away. This is still jerky, so I can still eat this and enjoy that as is. I don't have it spiced or anything, but, um, you know, it's still very enjoyable. Okay, uh, I've got a fair amount here that I'm going to have to go through. I think I will start with the beef liver, just to give you an idea of how this works. So, I am going to break some of it into smaller pieces a little bit as I put it in, just to make it a little easier. Just nice and crispy. It's also not bad to chew on. I mean, there's no flavor really to it, but... Okay, that's enough for the demonstration. Sorry for the noise, I'll try and edit that down well, as I do this. Getting there. Now, I just want to show you, this is taking a bit of grinding, so it's not as if this is going to be instantaneous, but uh, it's grinding on. You can also see how much volume is being reduced by this grinding. So I will continue to do this, and then I'll bring it back and show you what the completed product looks like. Okay, folks, time for a quick admission. Uh, when I set out to do this video and I sourced out the two pieces of meat, the beef liver and the brisket, it had been the first time that I used beef liver. I rationalized that it was a very lean meat. It would make a great material for doing this because I would not have to worry about any fat deposits throughout the meat like you saw with some of, of the brisket. Turns out it may not have been a great choice. Let me show you why. This is, after a lot of grinding, what I ended up with with the liver. You can see that some of it turned to an absolute powder, actually very powdery, and that would be nice. Problem is, is a lot of it didn't. As you can see, it's still very granular. And I, I considered using this, except that I tried to chew on a little bit of this, that's hard. <laughs> so I am not going to take this any further, the liver that is, with uh, making of the pemmican. So that was, I'll call it an experiment that didn't work out the way I had wanted to. And I'm not going to throw this away because I can reconstitute this in a little bit of water. I'll see what you can do with that. And that's something I just want to mention. It's a good time to mention it now. When you grind your meat, you're not obligated to make pemmican out of it. You can save it in its powdered format and Put it in just about any meal you want. In fact, you can fry it up, put it in soups and stews. There's all kinds of things to do with it. It won't stay preserved. 
anywhere near as long as it was, or will, in the full pemmican, but it is still usable all by itself. So let me just put the liver aside. Here's the brisket. That is what you're looking for. Can you see that? Just powder, light and fluffy. Looks great. Okay, what's the lesson to learn here? Well, number one is with the liver, uh, I'm going to recommend against using the liver when it comes to the beef. Brisket is a good choice because it's inexpensive, but as you saw, there was a lot of editing out some of the fat deposits. I guess what I'm saying is go for the leanest cut of meat that you can possibly get, and you'll save yourself some time and expense ultimately in the end. Doesn't mean you have to buy the very best or most expensive meat, just the leanest cut that you can get. Okay, so we're going to continue to make our pemmican with this because this is exactly what you're looking for. All right, next step is to weigh out how much powdered meat I have. And the uh, easiest way to do that is with a bowl on a scale, obviously. I'll turn it on, and with the bowl on top, it'll zero out. I do like using grams for this. Uh, if your scale works in ounces and you can work in ounces, great. Grams just makes it easier for this type of thing. And how much do I have? 124 grams. Just want to remind you, that's that full brisket minus a few cuts of fat and little pieces of meat that I took out because of the fat that was included within it. But look how small it got and how light it got. 134, 124 grams is 4.4 ounces. Not very much at all. I'm pointing this out for a reason. We have to equal the weight of the meat with rendered beef fat, which is tallow now. So I'm going to liquefy some of the tallow that I, I put together yesterday, and we've got to weight for weight. It's not cup for cup. It's not by volume. It is by weight, a one-to-one -one ratio. So I need 4.4 ounces of liquid tallow, or what was what did I say? 100, well, now it's saying 124 grams. Yeah, it just leveled out. All right, so what I'll do now is I'll set up to measure out my tallow and start mixing this together. All right, this portion of the process actually goes very quickly. That's 124 grams, grams of liquid tallow. As you can see, it's not very much by volume, especially when you compare it against the powdered meat. But that is the correct ratio, one to one by weight. So let's just pour it in. Mix it through. You do have to move, uh, not exceptionally fast, but a little bit fast here because you want to make sure it doesn't cool down on you until you're ready to put it in a mold or something. Now, I'm just mixing it through. It's pretty much mixed through right now, but I am just going to stir it for a couple of seconds to ensure that all the meat and all the fat does mix through nicely. Now, a couple of things you could do at this point. Let me pull that aside. If you have a larger quantity and you want to use, a, I don't know, a small baking pan of some type, then you can pour directly in that. If you let it cool down some, then you could pour it right on a baking pan in a, in a more uh, a, a lump or a clump of it that doesn't spread out. Right now, if I pour this on, because it is still so warm, it's just going to spread very, very flat. Um, yeah, so there's any number of options of ways of doing things here, but I'm going to use my silicone molds that I can that I used for storing the uh, additional tallow that I had made. You can still see it's still got tallow pieces all over it. Uh, wasn't necessary to clean it up just for this purpose. I just took the tallow blocks out, and now I'm ready to put this in. And okay, so this is the point at which if you're going to add anything to this, such as dried fruit, traditionally it would have been blueberries or whatever else was available that would provide nutrition as well as flavor. This is the point where you would not only dried but powdered. So it's all everything is powdered when it goes together. But I'm going to recommend for you that you wait until you see the next segment of the video before you decide to put anything in with your pemmican mixture. And I'll explain why then, as well as all the options for doing so. Right now, I'm just making a very, very base pemmican. All right, so all I have to do is just pour some of this into the molds to the amount you want. Not going to get a lot, am I? 
Remember, this is very concentrated food energy. How many blocks have I got there? I don't think I have enough for a fourth one, so I'll just kind of spread it among the different ones, try to even up the height of it. Yeah, okay, that's it. That's all there is to it. So I, I do have some more work to do. I gotta get cleaned up and I'm gonna let this harden. And once it's hardened, I'll take it out of the blocks and we'll continue the discussion on making pemmican. All right, so we're finished with our pemmican. There's one of the blocks as I removed it from the silicone mold. Let me put that aside, that looks great. All right, now that you've made your pemmican, what are you gonna do with it? How are you gonna store it? And how are you gonna consume it? Well, let's talk about storage for a minute. If you keep it in an airtight container and away from any moisture, it will last almost forever. And history does support this. Now, I like to take it a little bit further and I vacuum seal my blocks and throw them in the freezer. That way they'll last virtually forever. Now this specific block has been in the bottom of my food bag for over two years. I keep it there as a backup piece of food and just in case I end up staying in the woods a little longer than I expect to. And you know, it still looks like the day I packaged it. Okay, so that is storage. Now what about consuming it? You can eat it straight up if you want to. I'll tell you, most people, myself included, don't find it all that appealing. The reason B is, well, it has a very plain flavor. It's not the flavor so much as it is the texture. It kind of has a waxy mouth feel. So this is the reason why historically, historically other things were added to the pemmican, such as I mentioned earlier, dried and powdered berries are a great addition. All right, so in addition to adding things to the pemmican when you're making it, what else can you do with it? Well, you can cook with it. And I have a couple of videos on using pemmican as a basis for another meal. So if you take your pemmican and you add it into a stew or a soup, it's known as a rubabu. And if you take it and put it in a fry pan with other vegetables and fry it up that way, it's known as a rishol. And as I mentioned, I have videos on both of those if you're interested in seeing how I do that. All right, when it comes to adding things to your pemmican recipe, there are a few guidelines. Certainly, if you want to add things like dried and powdered berries or nuts or something like that, you can certainly do so. And I think this is an area where there's an opportunity for you to experiment and see what you can come up with. However, you should be aware, anytime you add something to the base recipe for pemmican, you potentially shorten its lifespan. And the reason is those ingredients can draw and hold water. And if that's happened, then of course your pemmican is going to go rancid. Now in reality if you have a short uh, expe expectation like you're going to consume your pemmican relatively short term then it's really not much of an issue and if like me you put it in a vacuum seal and throw it in the freezer it's probably not much of an issue it's just something to be aware of. There are a few things however that I would strongly recommend against adding to your pemmican. First off is salt. So contrary to what you might think, salt will not extend the life of your pemmican. It'll do just the opposite. It will shorten it. And the reason is if any moist air gets to your pemmican, the salt will draw the moisture in and make your pemmican go bad. This also applies to spices as well. Not that it will change the lifespan, but here's what happens. So you're mixing your pemmican together prior to putting it in a mold and letting it harden up. You add spices, chipotle, pepper, whatever else you want to add to it, you give it a taste and it tastes pretty good. The problem becomes about a year from now, those spices in your pemmican have a chance to intensify greatly. And then when you go to eat it, it's much, much stronger than you expected it to be. So my thinking is leave the spices out of your pemmican, leave it plain, unless you want to experiment with adding ingredients like berries and nuts and those types of things. And then, then when you want go to cook with it, like making the rishod or the rubabu, that's when you add additional things to it. All right, let's wrap this video up. You know, I know this video has gotten to be a little bit long. I wanted to make this as comprehensive a guide as I could for making pemmican at home using modern means. Still, it's possible that I have forgotten a few things or maybe things that I just wasn't aware of. And for that reason, I want to open it up to you. If you have any suggestions or alternatives to the way I showed in making pemmican, please put that in the comment section below. If you have any questions or other comments about about this video, put those in the comments section below. Okay, 
Until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.